How do I know? Well, I was very fortunate that my mother and her sister and her parents survived. That's right. <coughs> they, they all survived as a family intact. In our Beit Knesset in Beverly Hills where I grew up, which had between 800 to 1,000 people almost every Shabbat, I was one of the few, if not the only child of survivors, who had grandparents that survived the Shoah. Pretty amazing. About 20 years ago, <coughs> my grandmother, Alice's mother, came to Israel with my mom and, her, and my dad. One day while they were here, you may not remember this. One day we took grandma and our son Eli to Yad Vashem. We went, with their, with their, we went with her to the area known as the Valley of the Communities. Here, grandma looked at the huge wall. <coughs> Excuse me. Grandma looked at the huge wall with all the names of the towns and cities that existed in Hungary before the war. She pointed out where she pointed out where she grew up, where they lived, etc. And as she told her story, she brought she brought these cities, towns, <coughs> and villages to life for me. We filmed Grandma telling her story. Thank you. We filmed Grandma telling her story. It was an amazing event. Tonight, sorry, tonight, my mother gets to continue this tradition. Please welcome my mother. Too close. A, a little more. Away, away. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. What beautiful introduction. I couldn't have expected. It's really my son, the rabbi. Thank you so very much. My story starts in the year 1942 when the uh, Germans occupied the city of Preshov, which where we had moved from Ungvar to Preshov. I was about three years old, and my sister was not born yet, but in 1942, I was nine years old, and my sister was four years old. My father was a sales rep for a very well-known flower company, and any time the uh, director of the, of the factory used to come, uh, his chauffeur took me around the city in a car, I was floating on air. I've never been, I was only, you know, nine years old, what was the best thing? Anyway, the Germans marched in, and within a no time, no short time, they started collecting people, and who were the men, mainly men. At first, it was like uh, day work, then uh, different, then perhaps not returning. Anyway, we were uh, a nice middle-class family, had a lovely apartment, and we were, uh, had gone to the Jewish schools there, but we had to move from that apartment where we lived to have something like a one-room apartment into a, we were part of a, a group of other smaller apartments. Somebody requisitioned our apartment because we lived on the main street. Anyway, uh, things were really turning around in a bad way. They were catching people. This was actually more or less before Pesach. And um, as, as every day some new edict came out, so people, the men, the young men started hiding. And of course, uh, the Germans knew that Many people are hiding. They always had a list. Of course, uh, what happened, some of the young men started to come back because they wanted to be part of the Seder. They were caught. Sadly enough, they were caught. 
We were lucky. My father did not come out of, from his hiding place. And we were just sitting around waiting, not knowing what to do. A few days down the line, somebody comes running and, and yelling, you know, the Germans and the Slovaks are coming down the street. So when you hear something like this, you never know what comes next. So everybody was trying to hide um, somewhere, in their apartments, wherever, just not to be out front. It, whatever happened, my mother, my sister, and I, we were kind of left in the center, didn't know what to do. Then we realized that on the side, there is a, uh, an open door to a cellar. So we went down the steps and got into the cellar, pushed ourselves against the wall, and my mother put her hand over my sister's mouth. She shouldn't cough because we heard the big door opening. And the soldiers went around, went around, and they stopped at the edge of the cellar. And they looked down. We could see their boots. And they looked down and they said, there must no one be here. The cellar door is open. So it was like a first miracle. Quieted down, a few days later, my father came, was able to get out, and he said, we are not going to stay here. We are from Hungary, we're going back to Hungary. Well, that was easier said than done. So we did get a hold of a man with a horse and carriage, and took a couple of things along, and we started to go we would go toward Michalovce. Michalovce was closer to the Hungarian border. We were, we got on the, on the carriage at night, and what happens? The guy lost his way, so he wound up in the morning, we wound up in the same place where we started out from. We had to go back to the apartment. A few days later, my father said, we're going to start again. So that time, it already worked. We wound up in Michalovce. In Michalovce, my mother had a sister, and they happened to have a large wholesale uh, uh, f uh, store, food store, and uh, they, their store was not closed yet. Um, the rumor, they, their son was going to get engaged, was engaged, and the rumor was, if you get married, they will not take you which of course didn't turn out to be true. Anyway, he did get married and what did they had a, in, in a one room they put together 10 people and the rabbi and they made a little chuppah. And the only way I happened to find out because I was very curious and I could kind of somehow peek into the door and see what's happening. Otherwise, you know, I perhaps would not have known about it. And so and again, my things were getting to be very bad. So my father says, we are still trying to go to Hungary. He got hold of someone who was a smuggler, and he was going to take a few, a few couples, but he didn't want to take us children. So it was decided that my parents will go ahead, and we, they will send somebody for us afterwards to take us across the border. We stayed with my aunt and uncle, and... I don't know how many days it was, but not too many days. All of a sudden, my aunt and uncle come and tell us that, you know, your father and mother were already across the border, but were caught and were brought back and they were put in jail. So it was a terrible, upsetting feeling, my parents in jail. And they were in jail between Pesach and Shavuot, actually, seven weeks in jail. We were able to go and visit them daily, more or less, about perhaps an hour a day. They were, um, they were like smugglers, so in a sense it was a luck because they were not put right away into a wagon to go wherever that wagon went, but they were kept in jail. After, uh, uh, after they came out, my father said, well, okay, this is it. I'm not going to go without the children. We want to go again. And unless I find somebody, we're all going together. So uh, sure enough, he was lucky enough to find a young man from Ungvar who knew the way. And we started out again. 
And we had to stay in one of their villages probably about three days until maybe the right person to whom the money was paid to open the border or the, you know, to take us across. And then we had to walk through um, fields to get to, to Ungwar. But we got we got through, it was very difficult. We were walking, my father carried my sister on his shoulders. My mother uh, could barely make it. She was ready to stay on the field to sit down. As a matter of fact, she sat down. She says, I can't move, you, can't, you come back for me in the morning. Well, that didn't happen, we didn't leave her there. Finally, we wound up in the morning hours outside on the outskirts of uh, Ungvar. The, the place was called Sobrans. Sobrans was a small place where my father's sister happened to live. Excuse me. No, I don't want to put it there. Yeah, just here. Thank you. Anyway, so it happened to be a Shabbat that we, wa we knocked on the door. And of course, they were totally surprised. Where do you people come from? Uh, how are you? How did you get here? So uh, we sat down. They pulled down all the shades. The neighbors shouldn't see us. And my uncle ran to the shul, uh, to the main shul in the city of Ungvar, to let know some of the members of the family. My parents were both living before that in Ungvar. They were very well known. Our, all of my aunts and uncles, my grandparents lived not far away. So uh, people, you know, relatives were in shul. As, uh, so they, as soon as Shabbat was over, many, uh, some of them came and visited us. And it was decided that we cannot stay at my uncle's at that place. So then the next place would be uh, the caretaker of the cemetery was some kind of a far relation to my grandmother. And he had a family with six children, and we were put up in a hovel there. Uh, and, and we didn't know what, what, how long, or anything. Every time there was a uh, funeral, we had to be inside. Otherwise, we were playing among the kvarot. Uh, it was not exactly the best play place. Uh, we were there about four weeks. And uh, in the meantime, the family had been discussing what to do, where to go, what should, we, what should they do with, uh, with us. Everything, you know, we were, sort of, we were illegals, basically. But we spoke the language, and we, looked, we had no problem with that because we grew up in that area. Finally, it was decided that my parents will be taken up to the city of Debrecen, which was the second largest city in Hungary. And my sister and I will be going to my grandparents, which was another village across the city. So, of course, uh, my parents were uh, uh, taken with my aunt and uncle uh, to Debrecen, and my mother's sister, youngest sister, took us to be with the grandparents. Well, you should have seen how we, how we looked. I don't know if you know what... Uh, uh, turpentine is, well, that's what they had to wash our hair with because we were full of lice and I don't know what else. In any case, it was wonderful to be with my grandparents, the beautiful white uh, linen, uh, the, the warmth of the grandparents. Came Friday, they got up early, my aunt and my grandmother, and made delicious baking, you know, challahs and everything for Shabbat. It was a nice uh, summer illusion for us, for my sister and I. And uh, you see, my, my, I resemble my mother very much. And many of the neighbors knew my, my mother because she grew up among them. She went to, to school in that area. So uh, we are there outside. Also, they had a little vineyard. So uh, they, um, you know, we decided they were going to harvest some grapes. So, of course, uh, we offered, my sister and I, we're going to harvest grapes. They gave us a basket, and uh, it looks like, uh, you know, workers. Didn't take long, because what happens, we ate so many grapes that we, in no time we got sick. That was all end of the work. So, 
we wound up going home. A few days later, uh, we are outside in the yard, and we hear a big knock. Well, when you hear a big knock like that, and that time, it doesn't bode well. Sadly, you know, uh, as they say, when you have butter on your head, don't go on the sun. Meaning, you know, if you feel guilty, you know what's what can happen. Sure enough, we open the door, and there are standing three most good-looking Hungarian gendarmes with their feathers and uh, very fierce-looking. Never mind good-looking, very fierce-looking. And uh, my aunt explained that we are here visiting. It's summertime. We are whatever Hungarian city she used, not, from, not a word about Slovakia. And lucky for us, they accepted the story and they left. So it was, in a sense, another miracle. Of course, what happens, summer slowly ends. Come September, I have to go to school. My sister is younger, but I have to go to school. So again, it was decided to send me up to be with my parents in Debrecen. So my, my parents had lived with a widow lady. She, they had rented a one room. So I was added to that one room. But uh, my mother was very handy for many things. She helped her clean. She helped her sew. Uh, that time, uh, the uh, uh, Hungarians were having um, a lot of white overalls being sewn because it was for the army who was fighting uh, with the Nazis in Russia. So she, they had quite a bit of work. And... Uh, we left, lived a quiet life. There were other neighbors, and they were all Jews, but somehow nobody asked, where are you from? I sort of did go to school uh, most of the time, but never there was a, any kind of uh, visitor. I had to leave the class, but I managed to get there uh, often enough. And um, my father didn't do anything. We had a relative in, in that city who became like our headquarters, in, in, to find out as to what's going on. We had another cousin who also came from Slovakia, and he, uh, he was well off, and somehow he was able to get a lot of information from the police department. So every time they were going to look, identify illegals, he used to tell us there is going to be a razia tomorrow or the next day. So we kind of got out of the neighborhood. We took a train ride, to, to a range outside of the city, and, uh, or just went away from the neighborhood. It was, uh, you know, it was a fearful life all the time. You basically had to always turn around and see who is following you maybe, or perhaps would ask you a question. In any case, this was going on for, for a while. In 1943, uh, my sister had gotten whooping coughs, and my aunt brought her up to be with us. You, they said if you change uh, climates, maybe it would be better. So now we were together, four of us, in that room. But luckily, the, this lady, the widow lady, was very wonderful to us, and we were able to use her apartment. And uh, altogether, uh, we were really very quiet and very unobtrusive, except for our, what we needed to do. And this went on for a while. Um, my sister had acquired, uh, I don't know, I guess we bought a little chicken. And she started to teach that little chicken to dance. It was the cutest thing. Of course, it was a devastation when you had to take it to the shoychat. What can you do? You had to eat. Anyway, it was... Uh, so here we are. And uh, life is difficult already, difficult, because uh, many things changed. You know, you could hear what's going on in the, in the, with the war. In the, it, was, it was really, you had to be so careful every moment of the time where you went you, out the door, so to speak. And this, this went on till the Germans marched in. March 19, 1944. Uh, somehow, so anyway, 
they hardly marched in. They came up with new edicts. You had to wear the yellow star. Plus, they established ghettos in no time. And uh, this cousin of ours, his name is Julius, uh, they had said that they are going back to Slovakia. It seemed that at that time, Slovakia quieted down. Somehow the Germans had enough people. For whatever reason, they decided to go back. And, but we said we are not going back. We have nothing to go back for. Lucky for us, this cousin Julius had a, a, some papers, a name of a family with two, two daughters, and he gave us that information, and he says, here, you, said, you, you don't, you, you're not planning to go into the ghetto. You don't want to go into the ghetto. See if you can get these papers from the city hall, and if, if yes, maybe you can make use of it. So my mother put on her one coat with a yellow star, another coat without a star, and she walked into the city hall to the office clerk and asked for copies of the papers that she had in front of her. I assume the clerk looked at her, lady, what do you need these papers for? Or what happened to them? Where, where are you? Why are you looking for papers? Well, she says, we lost them. I don't know if she didn't explain how. And she says, you know, you can't walk around with the papers today. How do you expect me to be on the street? Lucky for us, he gave her all the papers that we needed. We, in turn, took a few of our Sieben Sachen. We didn't have much. And uh, took out another apartment in another area of the city and started to live our different life. There were bombings in between. The ghetto was uh, probably established in the meantime. We did not exactly know of everything. We saw people being marched across, but we didn't really, we didn't really accept the idea. We didn't know what was going on. So uh, we took out another, an apartment in a very different area. And the Allies were bombing at that time, I think uh, many areas, because they went through to Romania to bomb the oil fields, as we were told later. And we had, to, uh, we had this little apartment, which was rather good, uh, I think uh, for exchange of rent or some of it. Uh, there was a dog, a Hungarian sheepdog, and, my and my, the only one who could deal with him was my mother. It was amazing. I don't know how she did it, but anyway, and this cousin Julius also gave us a key to a, an apartment, to a villa across town. It was a very beautiful area of Debrecen. It was called the Nagyerdu, the big forest, and they had beautiful villas there. Also, the university was there and some other various uh, big hospital. So one day, we decided we better go and take a look at that villa. Sure enough, uh, it was a beautiful villa, and we decided we're going to stay there. It's a lovely environment. There's a little garden, uh, some uh, beautiful uh, linen, uh, some very good uh, in, the, in the break front, delicious uh, chocolate, which we haven't had. I mean, you know, we are going to live it up, of course. Uh, it wasn't that simple, but we did our best to use both apartments somehow. So as summer goes on, um, you hear, all, we, did, we were able to kind of catch, we found the radio. So we were able to catch at night the BBC. So some things we heard about the war, but that's, that's all that we knew. And um, all of a sudden, fine, everything is lovely in the summertime, again, there comes a big knock on the door, and my mother opens the door, and there stands a very good-looking uh, uh, officer of the army, of the Hungarian army, and he looks at us, and he says, who are you people? What are you doing in my house? 
So, of course, uh, uh, my mother says, come in, sir, you must be tired from your journey. Please sit down, let me make you an omelet, relax you. And in the meantime, my father says, you know, we have another apartment on the other side of town, and I have to go and get my papers. I don't have them here because we are only temporarily here. So he walked out the door, in the mean, and my mother was preparing some food for this officer. To our luck, he got a phone call. He had to go back to his army. He says, but I'm coming back, and I want to see all the papers and the lease. Thank God he never came back. It's another miracle. Okay, another month down the road, uh, the Chagim uh, Rosh Hashanah comes. Again, a lot of bombing. We, in this house, there was a basement, and we ran down to the basement. We found a, a bench to sit on and found a wooden um, bathtub, little, this kind that you used to, used to wash clothes in. We sat down, we put this above our heads because everything was shaking from all that bombing. And of course, cried my Israel. Thank God it passed. And another few days is quiet. And sometime in September, we uh, see people going by our garden with baskets and blankets. And so we asked them, where are you people going? What's going on here? Well, don't you know the Germans and the Russians are going to have a big fight because they are both at the, each end of the city and they all want the city back for themselves. So what do you do? We are going to the shelter from this big university. It's a huge university and there is a shelter there. Well, we couldn't tell them that we would welcome uh, uh, the, the Russians to come in and uh, liberate us. But it didn't happen that, uh, that way. We had no choice but to join them. We took a picnic basket and some little food and some uh, blankets and found our way. It was about a 20 minute walk from where we were. And we found a little corner of an area to kind of try not to be obtrusive, but we were surrounded by the goyim. You had no choice. As a matter of fact, uh, my father, who was a religious man, would not eat without a hat. Uh, you know, you can't think of that. But suddenly we heard some mumblings. Oh, they must be Jews. He's eating in a hat. Off came the hat, believe me. And uh, so this went on. And in the meantime, it was difficult. My father couldn't eat the food. And so my mother and I tried uh, for a f quite a few days, ran out very early in the morning before the fighting began, and ran over to our house and to the villa and see how we can put together a little soup, some vegetables from the garden. My mother was very good at that, and brought it back. But after a week or so, we just couldn't do it anymore. The fighting was much too fierce. And uh, all of a sudden, the Russians marched in and the Germans moved out. It was, in a way, for us a celebration, but in a way, the Russians were very wild. We were afraid of them. And uh, many, most of the people, this, it took about two weeks. It didn't happen overnight. And most of the people after that left, and we stayed longer. We just could not, uh, couldn't feel comfortable that what can happen if the Germans will retake the city, so we didn't want to expose ourselves. We stayed longer, but then after a while we just had to leave, except first my father went in the city and to the Jewish neighborhood that we knew already where it was before, since we lived in that city, and he came back and he says, there is no one around, maybe a young man or two who may have run away from the uh, Arbeitslager, from the work uh, camp. Uh, there are no people around, no Jews. It was a horrible, horrible feeling. But eventually we did move out and found an apartment in the center of the area which was Jewish, many, uh, last year or the year before. 
and we kind of established ourselves there. We had many visitors from young men who came back sooner. They wanted to be with family. They, wanted to, they couldn't believe their eyes. A family with two daughters, two children, is surviving or had survived. They didn't know what to think. So this went on for a while, and uh, we lived in this apartment. And then suddenly, my father says, I have to go to, it was in the middle of winter, I have to go to Ungvar. I must see my family. I must see what happened to them. So here we try to dissuade him. Um, it couldn't be done. He wouldn't, he, he couldn't, he wouldn't listen. So, okay, so we relented and we allowed him to go. And he went, and a few hours later, Somebody comes running to tell us, Mrs. Nyman, Mrs. Nyman, your husband was taken by the Russians. He was put into a, a wagon and probably towards Siberia. Well, listen, we just escaped a few things that happened, and all of a sudden, now there is no father. My mother being, the, she, she took on this mantle, and she, the next day, marched out and went to, she knew a little Russian, and she knew read and write Russian because that area was Ukraine where she grew up. And, you know, the Russian uh, uh, captains or the higher uh, uh, army people were very much nicer than the regular uh, soldiers. Plus, there were quite many Jews among them. Somehow she was able to convince somebody in a very high position that she needs to go and find her husband, who's the, she knows the train went toward Romania, or at least they found out for her where that train went. They were so nice to her, they managed to give her uh, on the Romanian Express, it was called a Rapido, a ticket, like almost a first class ticket, and it took her, she was on that, I don't know how many days, but she wound up in the city of Arad. And there was a Jewish community there. So she, I guess, was looking at the names on the wall about people, people's name. And suddenly she saw her husband's name on that wall. Year, later on, it turned out to be that my father was able to escape from the train before it reached Romania and made his way back. So thank God they returned. My father came back like, sick two weeks later, my mother came back even later, but we were again a family together, a family together. Made a, it, it, it was something unusual. Finally, after we moved out of this apartment, established ourselves a little bit in a different area, and slowly, slowly, uh, you know, the war ended on May 8th, 1945, slowly people, by the way, Auschwitz was uh, uh, liberated on January 27th, 1945, by the Russians. And uh, it was a horrible thing, but we found out later. In any case, um, slowly people were coming back, here a relative, here a sister. It was uh, not an easy, and not a, not a very, not a beautiful sight, to say the least. After about two years, in living like that, uh, you know, quite open under the Russian rule, my parents decided that we're going to Palestine. We are not, not going to stay with the Russians. We are going to Palestine. It was a lot of young people started going then, um, you know, halutzim to, to, to go to Palestine. We joined a group and my aunt and uncle came with us. Actually, my aunt, my mother had an older, uh, an older sister who, uh, who uh, lived at, in another city, but while she was ill, they brought her to Debrecen to the hospital. And when the deportation started, they took all these people from the hospital, and that group went to Austria. So she had come back. Even though she was a sick person, she managed to go through that few months in Austria and did come back home. So we were all very happy because my youngest aunt, who met uh, her, her husband there at that time already after the war, 
we were able to make a wedding in this aunt's house in the city of Nirbator. So it was a wonderful, you know, beginning of a celebration. So my aunt and uncle and my parents and we, it was decided we're going to go toward Palestine. We, uh, it, we have been on the road for a long time because at first the Russians didn't let us out even though there was a big group. Then we wound up in a displaced persons camp where we basically wound up to live three years. It was in the city of Wetzlar in the American zone. The only thing was that it was really, uh, eventually, in the beginning it was very difficult. There was not enough food, there was not enough kosher food, but all it got so somehow established. The uh, joint uh, helped a lot, the American army helped a lot, so it got established. But for us children, they made schools right away. There were many Polish and Lithuanian and Latvian Jews who came out after the war. The, somehow Russians opened up their... Uh, the borders, and they are, were able to get out. And among them were people who really knew Ivrit and really knew, were teachers in their time. So uh, they started teaching us and getting us ready to go to Palestine. Also, many shlichim were sent out from Israel to, to help the European Jews to come to Palestine. So Zionism was imbued upon us, and we loved it. And uh, I, I don't know, you know, when I think about it, how my mother managed in this one room to be always that we girls will always clean and neat. And, and uh, it, was, it was an amazing thing, but somehow we went with the times. You had no choice. And... Uh, we were constantly uh, walking in uh, on the different uh, events where we learned more again about Zionism and Hebrew songs. And we eventually were speaking Ivrit in the time that we were there. And then also we had uh, established contact with other cities in Germany where they had these kind of displaced persons places. And we used to have uh, uh, guys come over, soccer game, and exchange uh, groups uh, or uh, entertainment of some kind, Yiddish, whatever possible, uh, people who were talented. And of course, with the soccer games, well, don't ask, we girls stood around there and of course cheered for all the boys, they were so good looking. I mean, this was a wonderful pastime. And uh, so this was, uh, this life went on for three years in the city of Wetzlar. Beginning of February 1949, there was uh, the American army had decided that they are closing the, some of the camps. Between that, before that, on uh, one holiday, I think it was Hanukkah, uh, we had some American visitors, soldiers, come and bring, uh, just to get to see people, uh, one of them we became very friendly with, and he said to us, you know, my father told me that if I am able to help a refugee, I should. So it turned out to be we became very friendly. He brought us chocolate and coffee and all kind of goodies. These same people, when we came to America eventually, waited for us at the, at the ship, and we became, the, it was the most wonderful feeling. Anyway, uh, we, the, the uh, camp, got closed and we had to be moved out. And since our, as we were going, planning to go to Palestine, my father was not well. We could not take on the hardship to go to Palestine. Found out that we could get maybe a visa to America. But that took time. So we were moved over to another camp. And uh, in that camp, was already much nicer. We had our own uh, cottage, and uh, it was just somehow like living in a village. It was really, I have to say, it was very nice. And it took another six months because before we were able to get our, uh, our visa to go to America. But in the meantime, we, I had run across, or I had met a young man there who also waited for his American visa. And we had become very acquainted, very friendly. 
And he was able to come out sooner to America because he had, he had family in Los Angeles. And I had, uh, and family, myself, my parents and I, we wound up in New York. Well, you know, we had a lot of refugee friends and uh, New York at that time was teeming with refugees. You had started work and uh, I started school and then became very uh, knowledgeable. I can already go to work. Uh, anyway, I, we tried. My parents worked on, this, on the assembly line and we went on New York uh, on, the, on the subways. It was, but it was, uh, it was a life. You, you were here, we were free and uh, we could do anything we wanted. Uh, the lady, this uh, family, took me shopping with my mother and went to one of these big department stores. I've never seen so much merchandise in my life. I didn't know that time it existed. So uh, she was going to buy me a coat. Well, okay. Uh, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at that. Nothing was good enough. My mother was so upset with me. How can you be so obnoxious? I mean, here they want to help you. Finally, I wound up a beautiful dark red coat. It's really something wonderful. Anyway, uh, uh, down the line, we, I had been corresponding with this young man from Los Angeles. And three years later, he came to New York and we got married. So I had uh, moved to Los Angeles day after my marriage, so to speak, in 1952. And my, mother, my parents stayed longer, another year, and then they joined me in Los Angeles also. So I have to say that, thank God, America was beautiful to us. The people were welcoming. My parents worked very hard, and we all strived to do our life better. And, and thank God we achieved beautiful things. We were able to get into the community as time went on. We have, thank God, you know, three beautiful children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And we were part of the community and Jewish education. It, it, it's, it's a, in a sense, it was a wonderful life. And it is still a good life. Sadly, my husband is not at my side for, my, for many years. What, what can I say? Life moves on. But I thought I'll just mention a few more things about what he did during the war. So give me a few more minutes. In 1939, you know the Germans uh, occupied Poland and many, uh, he lived in the city of Munkacz. Munkacz was closer to the Polish border. And he and a lot of other friends were helping these uh, people to come and then move them on to go to bigger cities because Munkacz was a small city, uh, not small, but uh, to move them out. And somebody pointed the finger at him that he was the leader turned out to be that he had to escape and wound up in Budapest. There, the family had a, a uh, paint store, so he eventually established himself that he was able to get, for a while, uh, important paints to send to his father. But all the time he was working underground, he was helping to, uh, uh, to have, making all kind of uh, uh, false papers for people who, whom they found needed it. And he took a couple of uh, groups down to Romania to be able to put them on a ship to go to Palestine. Well, one time he was caught and he was put in jail uh, by the, with the Germans in the city of Oradeo Mare. And, but it happened to be it was a Hungarian jail. And the Hungarians could not understand how the Germans had arrested a Hungarian man. Somehow he was able to talk himself out of, uh, out of, uh, out from uh, this uh, jailer, jail place in a sense that he became very friendly with the jailer. They were playing cards and, and uh, drinking uh, beer. So uh, one day he tells the jailer, uh, uh, John, uh, I will go and help you and bring you all these goodies here. We have money. You know, let's celebrate. 
Of course, he went out never to return. And, uh, you know, the people who helped him, him were the Seventh-day Adventists. They were really helping him to get through and to get out from that city. So, thank God he survived the war. So, comes back to Munkac, and who arrests him? The Russians. Anyway, thank God he got through that too and managed to come to America, and we had a beautiful life, and, and thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. There's only one way, I think, to end tonight. You ready? Yes. Let's sing. Shira Tatikva. Oh, <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Kibud Kal Bachutz, refreshments outside. Thank you.